Anyway, I um, want to talk about a couple things first before we jump into our Bibles. I just want to call your attention to the blessing that is in front of the sound board over there. You see all that? That's that new stuff we've been talking about. There it all is. And uh, yeah, yeah, you can clap. God's favor is good, right? Anyone happy about that? Yeah. All right, you guys get a little fired up in here. It's okay. You get a little fired up in here. I'm fired up about Jesus. I hope you're fired up about wh what Jesus does. And, and so we see the evidence of his blessing right there. And uh, just to let you know that tomorrow, as soon as our service is over, uh, we're going to tear out all the old junk. And then s Monday morning, we're going to put in all that new stuff. And so I'm super excited about that. And speaking about, yeah, I mean, you can clap. Like, you can clap in church. It's okay, right? So speaking about tomorrow, like, more importantly than, than that cool stuff right there, more importantly than that is that uh, Casper, anyone in here know Casper? Raise your hand if you know Casper, right? Anyone know Casper up in here, right? Casper and his mom are getting in that tank tomorrow. Awesome, right? Awesome, awesome. Uh, listen, he's not here. I've been praying. Power of prayer. Somebody say amen, please. Prayer, prayer. Like, this is the evidence that prayer works. Casper's crazy. Do you understand Casper's crazy? He, and I can't say what he does because, I, you know, he's crazy. But, you know, I just, I, you know, when, 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 when God said start a church, you know, the thing that was in my mind wasn't the, the, the dude at the, at the church dressed in his slacks and, sh you know, nice, sh right? It was Casper, right? It was guys like him, you know, like freaky looking, covered in ink, cussing and doing drugs and smoking and just a nut job, right? That's who I love, right? So I've been praying for Casper. He's my next door neighbor. And I've been praying for him for five years to please come to church. And then I'd invite him and I'd invite him. Oh, we're coming, we're coming. Never came. Now you can't keep him out of here, right? You can't keep him out of here. He's every single week. He's just, I go outside a couple weeks ago, and he's sitting in his driveway just reading scripture verses that Mike Gregoire sent him on the phone. Just sitting out there reading. I mean, I love that. And, and so tomorrow he, he takes that step of obedience, and he says to the world, like, I'm not my own anymore. Awesome. So, and then, listen, the, and, and here's the cool thing. Right. Not only is that like that's not good enough. Right. So here's his mom. Like so Casper is not a young dude. I mean, he's fairly I don't know how old Casper is, maybe 35, something like that, 40. <coughs> but his mom, she's believed in, in God her whole life, but she hasn't gone to church in forever. Right. She just never found a church that would just make her feel like this is where God is and I want to hear from him. And so she lives in Tampa. But she's been praying for this crazy dude for a million years, right? And so she's getting baptized with him tomorrow. Like, she's never done this either. Never. She believed in God, never got baptized, right? So, so, but she just, she just loves you guys. And she loves this church. So she tries to come up like every other, every third week to be with us. And uh, her name is Cynthia. Cynthia Casper. Like, not Casper the Friendly Ghost. It's Casper with a K. But... Anyway, so she's going to be up here, and they're getting baptized tomorrow. It's just an awesome, awesome day. So super, super excited about that. What I'm not super excited about is that my son Jackson just broke his arm this afternoon. So you all know that Jameson did that a couple months ago, right? And she just got out of her cast recently, so to, you know, has to one-up his sister. It's always competitive, these kids, right? So he broke the same exact bone in the same exact spot. That's Jackson for you. He was jumping on a trampoline, <laughs> not to judge your pastor because it's a very safe trampoline, if there is such a thing. Fully enclosed, fully netted, no exposed metal, impossible to get hurt. Jackson. <laughs> Jackson. So anyway, um, I want to welcome you all. I'm excited. I'm like a caged animal up here right now, okay? And so I'm excited to share God's word with you. I'm excited for whoever's watching online or whoever will watch online. This is a, a crucial, crucial weekend, a big weekend, an important weekend. And, and we're taking a break from the, the, uh, the series that we've been going through, Matthew chapter 5, 6, 7. You know, the Sermon on the Mount, Red Wall, Red Letter. That's been good. I hope it's been a blessing to you. It's been a blessing to me. He's teaching us how to flourish as a people. But uh, uh, tonight, this weekend, I want to talk to you about something 
that's a little bit different. Same God, um, same people, like his people, how they should flourish. I want to talk to you um, tonight about the original uh, church planter. We're doing our vision dinner on the 17th, and you should come if you've never been to one, so you can come and hear the history of the church and where it is and where it's going, and you can ask questions and stuff like that and figure out how you can be a part of something that's bigger than your 9 to 5. Um, but I'm going to kind of blow up vision here tonight, but it's not about my vision. It's not about revolution's vision. I want to go back 2,000 years to the original church planter, Jesus Christ, and he said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. And in Colossians chapter 1, Paul says that Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. So the only person who, can, who is really qualified to speak of the vision of Jesus Christ's church is who? Jesus Christ, right? He's the one. And so we want to, uh, we want to do that. And so what we're going to do tonight is I want to talk to you about the bullseye of the body. The bullseye of the body. What I mean by that is that, that when, when Jesus is establishing his church 2,000 years ago, and he's building it even today. Did you know that Jesus is building his church today? He's doing it right now, right? That's why you're here. You're, you're stones. You're living stones. He's trying to get you in the right place so he can build on that, right? And so when, 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 he, when he builds the body of Christ, the church, he, he, he wants it a certain way. And, and heaven forbid a, a man or a woman in a church, a, a leader with a lot of uh, letters after his name or titles before their name, uh, decides a different vision for Jesus Christ's church. That's not the way it works. Nobody's qualified to do that, right? Nobody. There's only one. It's his church, right? He gets to decide. He's the head, we're the body. He's the brains of the operation, okay? And so he, he, the bullseye for the body is what exactly, when he established a church and he's building this church, what's it supposed to look like? How's it supposed to act? What's it supposed to be? What is it supposed to do, right? We can't just make up our own thing. A lot of autonomy in the church, right? Kind of free to do some things that we want to do, but we're not free if we're part of Jesus' church to do things contrary to what Jesus says to do, okay? So we don't have that liberty, um, and so we want to study the bullseye, the thing that we should be aiming at for the church, and it's not just the bullseye for God. It's the bullseye for the enemy, too, because this thing that we're going to talk about tonight is the thing, the singular thing that Satan shoots his little fiery arrows at, and if he can land right there, he can cause the church steal, kill, destroy. He can cause it to separate, divide, dissension, problems, splintering, and weakness. And that's where the church in America is. We're weak compared to what we should be. We should be the most powerful entity on the planet, right? Because God is involved in this. This is his church. This ain't IBM. This is not Microsoft. This isn't Facebook. This is the kingdom of Christ. And it should be powerful, and it's not. So why is it not? Because the enemy's going after this thing just like God wants to go after this thing. And so what I'm going to do tonight is a little bit different in the length of Scripture that I'm going to read. Normally I read a little section and we'll kind of go over it. Tonight, I'm going to ask for your patience. I probably don't need to ask for it because you are a Bible church and you love, here's a great place for it, amen, you ready? And you love God's Word. Awesome. So why don't we do this? We're going to put it up on the screen. Here's three sections of Scripture, and I'm going to read these things out loud. It's going to take a little time to read through. The reason why I'm reading all this is because, you know, there's, there's churches all over the world that pick a little spot out of the Bible, right, and they build their whole church on it. They build the whole very narrow denomination uh, on that verse or that little chapter, that little section, and so if we want to see, if I'm going to make a claim that, 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 that the sweet spot, that the target of Jesus Christ's church is anything, we should be able to find it in more than one spot, right? It should be something that's just all throughout the New Testament, which is where we're living now. So what you're going to see in these sections of Scripture is, is very repetitive stuff. But why is it in here like this? Is it not to prove a point? This is what I want, right? This is what I want. And so we're going to read these sections of Scripture all together, one right after another, and then we'll go back, okay, and we'll, and we'll examine all three of them separately to see what they say. You guys in on that? Are you ready? Do you have a copy of God's Word in front of you? 
Okay? If you don't, you're cheating yourself. I might want to throw some things in there that you don't know about, right? Get a copy of God's Word in front of you. Don't trust the crusty old car guy. You got a Bible, right? Here we go. You ready? Okay, so Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. 1, uh, 14, 1 through Romans 15, 7. Here we go. Accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For, an inst for instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall, and with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. In the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day, while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor him. Those who eat, eat any kind of food do so to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be Lord both of the living and of the dead. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. I know and am convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. But if someone believes it is wrong, then for that person, it is wrong. And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, you are not acting in love if you eat it. Don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. Then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God, and others will approve of you too. So then, let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. You may believe there's nothing wrong with what you are doing, but keep it between yourself and God. Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something they've decided is right. But if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you are sinning if you go ahead and do it, for you are not following your convictions. If you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. We who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about, the, about things like this. We must not just please ourselves. We should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. For even Christ didn't live to please himself. As the scriptures say, the insults of those who insult you, O God, have fallen on me. Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. And the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. May God 
who gives this patience and encouragement help you live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept each other, just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be given glory. First, First Corinthians chapter 3. Ready for the next one? 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to start in verse 10. That's a lot right there, right? Your phone talking to you, Mimi? Are you all ready? Okay. No? Good? I want to leave. No child left behind, right? No child left behind. Because of God's grace to me, this is Paul, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Okay? Last but certainly not least, my favorite book of the Bible. You can't go to heaven unless Colossians is your favorite book of the Bible. Do you know that? Just kidding. <laughs> totally kidding. It's a great book, though, right? Okay, so Colossians chapter 3. We're talking about us as a people, his church. Look here in verse 11, 311, right? You're there? You looking at it? In this new life, what's that mean? If anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation, right? New person. The old has died. Behold, there's a new person, right? Old, old habits, old thoughts, old per- perception, old priorities, old habits, old likes, old desires. Those are dying daily, let's hope, right? Aren't, aren't we? And there's a new person, like literally new, someone new. You've got to get your brain around that. You're not just a, a you know, improved Kim. You're not. Kim's gone. There's someone new. It just looks like her, right? So in this new life, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free, Christ is all that matters And he lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone, say anyone, who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must, what's that? Must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. All right. That's a lot. That's a lot. I think the length of Scripture would tell you the weight of the, of the issue. Okay, So let's just talk about this for a moment. What's the thing? Can anyone tell me what the thing is that's the bullseye for the body? Did anyone? So, what was the, so we, had, we read three sections of Scripture. And what was the one thing that we heard in all of them? What was the one thing that keeps getting repeated over and over again that God wants in his church? Does anyone know? Harmony. Boom. Harmony. 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 That means different voices, right? 
right? That means that the Gaithers don't get up there and everyone says, all right, we're all going to sing baritone today. Like, that wouldn't sound so good. It's when everybody's different, they come together and make a much more beautiful voice than any one single part can make on its own. Do you understand what harmony is? And not only do they all say harmony, but the one verse I want to bring to your attention is the one in Romans uh, 14, verse 19. So then, let us aim for harmony. Let us aim for harmony in the church, right? Let us aim. That means it's intentional. That means we don't just welcome harmony. We don't just accept harmony. No, we aim for it. We go after it. We resource that thing. That means effort. That means intentionality behind what we're doing. We want diversity. We want harmony in the church. We're not just allowing it. We're not just saying, oh, it's okay. If No, it's, that's what we want. Jesus wants harmony in the church. That means he wants diversity in the church, right? You guys all with me on that? Okay, it's not optional. So let's just talk about this first. Let's, let's see. Remember now, let, we're going to examine what God wants, like what harmony means and how to get it. And then we're going to see what the enemy does to shoot a, an arrow at that thing to cause division. And listen, we all know this massive division in the body of Christ. Right? We got these little, we got a thousand different denominations. We got Reformed theology, Arminian, Cessationist, Continuationist, this Baptist, that. We got a million people, and that's all we do is fight. And hey, brother, I love, hey, sister, I love you. I just can't hang out with you. Er, that's wrong, right? That is not right. What he says is harmony, togetherness, diversity in one room. The body of Christ is a lot of different people. And so, Let's look and see what God wants and then how the enemy tries to disrupt this. Let's look at right there at the beginning. He says, uh, accept other believers who are weak in faith. Pause. Already a problem. We're in impasse. We're in impasse right there, right? Accept the other believers that's, that are weaker in faith. Well, who's, who gets to decide that? Me? You? You get to decide who's weaker in faith? I think I know what I'm doing. I think I know some stuff, right? You think you know some stuff? We all think we know some stuff. Why do we think we, why do we believe what we believe? Because we think what we believe is wrong, right? Who believes that what they think is true is wrong? Raise your hand. Yeah, of course not. You're not going to do that because what you believe, you think it's true. So, so my, 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 and so that's in our world, right? What do we do when we run into that impasse? Nobody gets to decide. He doesn't say there. There's no chart that says this is how you measure the faith right here, right? Between the two of us, who's the one who's weak in faith? You don't know. And neither do I, right? So, so in this world, forget the church for a second. In this world, what do we do when it's your way against my way? We fight, <laughs> right? We fight. And we, we try to exalt ourselves over the other person. No, I'm right. My way is the highway. Right? That's the way you do it. I'm right. You're right. True? That's the way we function out there. I have a better plan than you. I have a better resume than you. I have a better idea than you. I'm right about this. You're wrong. Like, and so in the church, it's like that too. We all have all these denominations. They all think that they know the answer, right? Let's just go back a little bit, a little fresh review here. When there was nothing... What's in nothing? Tell me. Show me how much is in nothing. Just show me. Show me, show me, show me, show me. This much, right? In the nothing, there was something, and the something spoke into the nothing, and there was something. Everyone's brain just blew up, right? Ba-bam! So if you can't figure that out, who are we to think we have it figured out? Right? Who could figure this God... We are finite. He is infinite. To, to, we, listen, here's the universe, and above and beyond the universe is God. You, it's impossible to fathom the complete fullness of who he is. It is impossible, and so we need to give people some space. Okay? And that's what he wants for his people. So how do we know who should be right? You have less faith than me. I have more faith. I know what's right about you. And you don't. And in this world, we exalt ourselves. And we fight for our rights. And we fight to be right. But that's not the way it is in God's economy, right? Everything just go like this. Whoop! That's what God does, right? So, so we're talking about relationships with people. 
Who has more faith? Who has little faith? Who's right? Who's wrong? Well, we don't know. But what we do know, because God's word is good, that in Ephesians, he talks about marriage. Right? That's an awesome, that's the most important relig- um, relationship on earth, is it not? Say yes, because it is. So how do we do this? Do we lord over our wife? Do we demand our way? Some buffoons do, and they end up single. Or we do what the scripture says, which is mutual submission. Right? Ephesians 5.21 says, submit to one another. Why? Out of reverence for Christ. See, see, that's where God gets the glory instead of the one getting the glory because he or she got their way. Jesus gets the glory when we submit to one another, never imposing our way and our will upon somebody else, but lowering ourselves. The, the kingdom of God is, all, is like the president and the vice president, the mayor who would be in the kingdom of God would be the most humble one, right? Not the one who's exalting himself over everybody else. I know, I'm the boss. That's not the way it works. Not the way it works in the kingdom of God. So we're supposed to be humble, and we're not supposed to exalt ourselves. So when you talk about this issue right here, about accepting other believers who are weak in faith, you should assume that you're weak in faith. Assume that you're weak in faith. Never exalt yourself, but submit to one another. Outdo each other in honor. Consider others more important than yourself. And so... What do we do when we have this impasse? Well, he's talking about people that have this impasse. You're different. You believe different than me. You think you know, and I think I know. Bam! What do we do? See, in the world, right? Tell me if I'm wrong. You can help me with the sermon. In the world, we are tribal. We like to hang out with our own, don't we? Everyone does. We like to hang out with our own color, our own age, our own likes, our own dislike. Whatever it is that puts us together, we hang out with those people. And our differences separate us, does it not? Come on now, right? Honestly. We could say we're not prejudiced and all that anymore. We're lying to ourselves if we are because we all are a little bit because we like to hang out with our own people. That's what we do. But the Bible is saying something different here. He's saying don't just, don't just say, well, they're all different, but he says accept them in. And, and when I mean accept, like, I don't know about you guys, but when I heard the word accept, I started thinking, like, tolerance, right? Isn't that what the world preaches now? Tolerance. Can't we all just get along? You know, the Muslims and the Jews and the Hindus and the Buddhists and the Christians, and it's all good. It's all, and like, they just accept me for who I am. Okay, that's awesome. You can accept people for who they are. But that's not what this accept means. Accept in our world is, yeah, it's cool if you do that. Just do it over there. Don't bother me. As long as you don't infringe upon me, you can do whatever you want. Am I lying here? Am I making anything up, or is this where it is? It's the way it is. But in the church, it's supposed to be different, is it? See, in the church, it says accept, but see, accept is not the best word there. See, the other translations, you got to go to some more translations. Some of them say welcome. Welcome other believers. Some say receive other believers. So it's not just like, yeah, you're different than me, so do it down there at the Baptist church. But over here, we're different. No, 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 no. He says, receive and welcome them. Don't just be okay with what they do. Be okay with what they do in your face. Because you lower yourself because they're more important than you. So you see this book right here? This is a, this is a Bible. This is, um, this is a new translation that came out fairly recently. I really don't know much about it. It's called the Passion Translation. Anybody heard of this before? You have? You? You? So I never, I got this as a gift like six months ago. And it's been sitting on my office floor and my pile of books that entire time. And I've never opened it before. I've never even had the inclination to crack this thing open before. Until I was studying this. And I'm sitting at my desk and I saw the word accept and I said, Look, I still have the wrapper on it, right? The wrapper's still on this thing. I never opened it. But I felt led to open up the Bible. You know what? I wonder what the Passion Translation says about this. Oh, my, I guess I should have worn my glasses. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, <laughs> you want to hold this for me, Mimi? This is what the Passion Translation says. You ready? 
offer an open hand of fellowship to welcome every true believer, even though their faith may be weak and immature, and refuse to engage in debates with them concerning nothing more than opinions. Bam! That's awesome. Welcome with an open hand of fellowship. You know what the word fellowship is in Greek? It's koinonia. And it's translated most often fellowship, which most people don't even know what that means. Like you're translating it to the, to the word nobody understands. What is fellowship in the church world? You know, you go downstairs after the service and you have fellowship with your brothers and sisters. You have some punch and some snacks like Danish after church, right? That's what fellowship has always been. But is that really fellowship? It's not really fellowship at all. Koinonia, yes, it translates fellowship, but it translates much better this way. And these, these are parts of the definition of why they're not used most often. I do not know. Communion. Communication. Facebook people. Right? Talk to each other. Even if you're different. How about these? These are even better. Participation and partnership. Clearly, it does not say, accept who they are, be okay with it, as long as they're at that church, not at my church, right? No, it says to welcome them to participate with you in this endeavor. Not just accepting them like it's okay that you're crazy. And, and listen, there's, there's all these different sides of Christianity, all these different streams and, 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 and tribes, and, and, and we're, 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 we're expressive and charismatic, and we're, 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 we're quiet, and we wear a suit, and, and you don't know, talk in church, and some people are yelling and screaming, and this lady's over here dancing before the Lord, and this one over here is going, I can't believe she's dancing before the Lord. And then the dancer over here is going, look at that stuffy old guy over there, and we can't hang out together. And it's a disaster. And the Bible's saying, to extend an open hand of participation to the, to the dancing lady and to the, to the one who's quiet and reserved. Listen, you don't have to dance physically to have your spirit be dancing inside of you. The person who's calm might be just going crazy on the inside for the Lord, but you just don't see it, right? So, so we have to just be welcoming those that are different and stop arguing. It says it. It says stop arguing with people about what's right and what's wrong because you think you're right. Who knows the thoughts of God? Exactly. Do we know some things? Yeah. You know the fullness? No, you do not. We need to stop acting like those that think they do. And so Paul, you know, anticipating People would wonder, you know, what does this mean? What does it mean? He gives them some examples. He says, for instance, a person believes all, it's all right, you know, eating anything, certain foods, right? There were some dietary laws. There were religious dietary laws. And even to this day, there's some groups of people in Christianity that believe that these certain dietary laws are still being used. And some people think that they're not being used. And they were back then, too. They were squabbling about that. And he's using that as an example. He says, for instance... He goes on, he says, uh, verse 5, in the same way. And so it's, it's, these are examples to, to glean principle out of. And it's not just about food. And it's not just about holy days. But he's saying these are examples of different things that would split people. And we have differences of opinion. Certain foods, certain days. Listen, there's tons of people that are Sabbath people, right? Traditional Sabbath, Friday night to Saturday night, that's the Sabbath, that's when you go to church, and that's when you worship, and that's it. And some people are like, no, I do that on Wednesday. <laughs> oh, I can't, I can't go to church with you then. You're a heathen. Know anyone like that? And what, I, mean, I mean, we're all, we're all Christians, right? We're saying that this book is ours, and clearly that's not what Paul's saying right here, right? He's saying any day, just whatever day you choose, that day is good. I mean, he says it. Whichever day you choose is acceptable. Be fully convinced of that. And whatever day you're doing it on, you're doing it to honor the Lord. So what does that mean? Space, people. Space. 
Give each other some space. Breathe. Space. He says, don't condemn. Don't. Look, he says, verse 3, don't look down on them. Don't condemn them for, for doing what they do. Look at it says, for God has accepted them. I mean, if God has accepted them, why are you not? He's accepted them into the family. He said you can go to this church. So why is it that we have higher standards than Jesus himself? Who are we to set such a high bar, even higher than Jesus would have? He says, uh, you can't just impose your will and your way upon everybody else because you see it there, you no longer live for yourself, you're living for the Lord, right? You're living for the Lord. So your opinion, let me just burst your bubble here, okay? Your opinion just doesn't mean anything, and neither does mine. Truth is truth, God is God, I am not, neither are you. And so he says, you live for the Lord. Well, how does the Lord live? Well, you see in Philippians 2, it says, we're supposed to have the same attitude as Christ did. He considers others more important than himself. And so that's the way we're supposed to be. Not your way, your way, my way. I'm right, you're wrong. I impose, I exalt my way on top of you. I pressure you. I, I, may, I manipulate this to move this body to the way that I want it. And that's not what God says to do in any way, shape, or form. We have to give each other what? Space. Give each other space. Like, Ramon and I have been saying this a little bit lately. Get over yourself. <laughs> Me too, right? Get over yourself. Like some of this stuff that people argue about in church and what they want and what the church should be and how it should look and how it should function. You realize, I mean, I don't know if maybe you didn't realize this, but that, that this isn't new. That, like, crazy nut jobs like us, we've been arguing about this for, seriously, 2,000 years. Like it has, and I, I can guarantee this. I can guarantee this, okay? And I love this church. I love you. Yeah, we're not going to figure that stuff out. We're not those guys. No one in here is that smart. It's just not going to happen. So what do we have to do? We have to follow the book, and it says give space. Give space. So um, there's no certain day that's wrong. There's no certain food that's wrong. Well, kind of. See, there is a certain food, and there is a certain day that's wrong. It's wrong if it's causing someone else to have a problem. It, you know, you may be worshiping well, right? God's looking at you going, oh, that guy's awesome. He loves me. That's great. But if it's causing someone else to have some problems in their walk with the Lord, then it's wrong because even though you know you can do it, it's wrong if it's causing somebody else because you're, you're supposed to consider them more important than yourself, right? But here you are imposing your thing. You think it's right. He says, yeah, that, that's cool, but it's wrong if you're doing it and it's hurting another. So you're, because of your ability to worship a certain way, you're causing someone else to not worship. I used, I think, an example this Wednesday night. So I'm up here preaching right now, right? Right now. Let me, let me ask you a question. You don't have to raise your hand. But who believes it's okay to, like, dance before the Lord? I, I think so. I'll raise my hand, right? How many people think it's okay? Like, some churches, you know, you ever see the churches have, like, flags and stuff? Right, and they're dancing, right, and it's cool, right? Who, who thinks that's okay? Nobody in here, I don't, a couple hands didn't go up, right? Maybe because you think if, I, if you raise your hand, I'm going to say, okay, here's the flags, go do it, right? <laughs> it's totally not going to happen. But let me ask you a question. So I'm up here preaching. So dancing before the Lord is great. Flags are great, right? What happens if I'm up here preaching and, 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 and Paula gets up and she starts doing this right here? Right here, just right here. And, and so nobody can hear anything I'm saying. Nobody can see it. Not right. Just total. Like, is she worshiping? Let's hope. But is it right? What if she's worshiping well, but but a hundred other people are just watching her? Is that right? So in that case, that would be the wrong thing to do. Would it be wrong for that same person to go right back there and do it as to not be a distraction to others who are trying to keep their eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? Would that be wrong? Say it would not be wrong. Because it would not be wrong, right? Because she's considering other people more important than herself. That's how we get along. Husbands and wives, you start getting your eyes off of the Lord and start getting your eyes on yourself or on your wife, there's going to be a problem. But when we both have our eyes on the Lord, then there's not as many problems, right? That's what he says. Too. How do we run the race with endurance that God has set before us by keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And so if, we, if we're practicing something that's causing another to not be able to worship well, 
Um, look at 14, verse 13. So let's stop condemning each other. And decide instead to live in a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. Stop worrying about what everybody else does. Worry about what you're doing. Worry about what you're doing in the church. What are you doing here? That are, you, are you helping people get built up in the Lord? Are you helping people keep their eyes on the Lord? Or are, you, are you making people get their eyes off of the Lord? Stop worrying about what everybody else is doing. Start worrying about what you're doing. Look at verse 20 through 22. Same thing. Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. It is better not to eat meat. Here's some just examples. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine. You're like, well, I don't do either one of those. Okay. Or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. So like, is it wrong to do certain things if you believe and you're convicted completely that you've read the scripture and you believe that this is the way that God wants you to worship? Is that wrong? It's not wrong. If you impose it on everybody else and make them accept it and exalt yourself and force it upon people, that's wrong. He says, you may believe there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but keep it between yourself and God. Don't be the show. Okay? There's only one person who gets the show here. Jesus. Jesus Christ. Okay, It's not about you. We have to stop pushing our rights around. I have to be right. This, I get to do this. Don't stop me. No, you consider other people more important than yourself. You wouldn't do that. So even if you think you are right, and because that's what the, a lot of people say that too. Well, 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 well we want to give leeway. We want to give space. But, 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 but I believe that that, that, is, that is heresy. That's, that's, you know, there's some churches that do not believe that you should uh, play musical instruments in church. Did you know that? They think it's absolute heresy to have this stuff. Okay? And so to say, but it's wrong. God said you can't do that, and so I'm going to pick at your church, and I'm going to protest what you're doing, and I'm going to, I'm going to force my, don't do this anymore, right? I believe it's not just leeway. I believe that you guys are wrong about this, and, and you need to stop it. You know, the Holy Spirit police. There's a lot of them out there. Well, let's just see what God's Word says about this. What if you think you are right, and they are wrong about their practice, about what they're doing 14.4. 14.4 says this. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with Carl's help, well, wait, 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 hold on. With Mimi's help, with Michael's help, with, what does your Bible say? With whose help? With the Lord's help. Right? He don't need your help. <laughs> he don't need your help. I mean, he says, uh, their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. Look at verse uh, 10 through 12. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scripture says, surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. He, we, we, we don't need to go around policing everybody's practice. We need to give them space because at the end of the day, we're all going to have to stand before God and, and give an account for all that we do. And it's, it's going to be a much heavier day than the day you confront them. So give them the space to be able to, like, just breathe. Like, I think the church just needs to breathe. You know what I mean? Just please. So you read all this stuff about aiming for harmony. Verse 5, may God who gives us patience and encouragement help you to live in complete harmony with each other. Not partial, not kind of, but complete. And then he says, as is fitting for followers of Jesus Christ. That's the way we're supposed to be living, right? That's what it says. 
And forget about your opinions for a second on how we're supposed to do stuff. The Bible says we're supposed to give space. The Bible says we're supposed to aim for diversity and, and consider it actually good. That not everybody is exactly like you. And it's okay in the way that they practice, in the way that they love the Lord, in the way that they worship. And so you wrap this all up. He goes back to the same kind of verbiage in verse 7 of chapter 15. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you. Right? Are you right about everything you believe about Jesus? Probably not. But has Christ accepted you? When you bent the knee to him and said, yes, what you did on the cross is for me. You are the son of God who took away my sin. Are, has, have you been accepted by Christ? Even with all of your bad theology and all of mine, aren't we accepted by Christ? Say yes. Please say yes. I want you to be saved. Right? We are. So just as you were accepted, so should we. Why? So that God will be given glory. Isn't that the object of the church? That God receive glory. And so listen, if you, the flip side to that is if you don't accept all true believers into the fellowship, into participate, not just do it at your own building. If we as a church here at Revolution do not accept those that are different into active communication and participation in what this church does, then we are robbing God of the glory he deserves. And for us to be so narrow-minded that it's my way or the highway, then you are, you are robbing God of the glory he deserves. And that can't happen here ever. Ever, okay? I honestly think that we have higher standards than Jesus. You know, we, we, you, you could be a Christian, but you just can't hang out with me. Like, why? Those boots aren't the, that's not on the dress code here. You can't, I know you love Jesus, but you, you know what I'm saying? Like, we, that's what we do. Like, what you, I, I, I heard you speaking in tongues. I heard you prophesying. I, I saw you dancing. I saw you, I love you. You're a Christian, but I, not here. Not here. I love you. I'm for you. I'll pray for you. Just don't come to my church. What is that? Awful. Awful. And when we do that, we are robbing Jesus of his well-deserved glory. We have to give people space. Would you agree that that's what this is teaching us? That's what he wants. That's the bullseye for his church here. Let's go to the next section. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Okay. Paul's writing there. He says he's laid this foundation. And it was not because he's awesome. It's the grace of God upon him that he would actually be used for the ministry of Christ. Like, that's a privilege. Say, that's a privilege. It is a privilege. And so Paul, who's awesome, right? But he doesn't say it's because I'm awesome. He says, because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. And what's that foundation? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The church is built on Jesus Christ. It's for Jesus. It's through Jesus. It's, it's by Jesus. It's all glory to Jesus. It's we study Jesus. It's we praise Jesus. It's we focus ourselves on Jesus. It's because we help other people get to know Jesus. Everything is about Jesus. You know, the Trinity is an amazing, amazing entity. I don't even understand all of it. And God the Father is awesome. But he said... My son has all authority. Follow him. And the Holy Spirit's number one job here in this earth right now is to convict us of sin. And the sin of the world is what? Not believing in Jesus. His number one job is to point people to Jesus. The Father and the Spirit all say it's about Jesus. And the church is all about Jesus Christ. And anything else is wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. All glory to Jesus Christ in the church. Okay, and so that's the foundation. Now, you guys understand that Jesus is not concrete, right? He's known as the foundation. He's known as, what, the cornerstone, right? He's not a rock. He's the gate, but he's not a fence, right? This is just figures of speech here, trying to word picture so you can understand something. So keeping that in mind that he's not really a foundation like we know it, like this thing right here. 
but he's the thing that all things are, are weighted on, and, and that's the strength and the power and the stability. The entity itself is built on Jesus. And so it says, anyone who builds on that foundation, who's that? Anyone who builds on that. Raise your hand. Right, right. If you're making, listen, it's, it's not just like pastors and, and small group leaders and, and, and right? It's, 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 it's anyone who would make another disciple of Jesus. You're taking this thing that, that was started way back then and you're building upon it. It's all, tell, it's all telling people, hey, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. But we're to build on that foundation so it could grow, right? That's your job. It's not just my job or Pastor Ramon's job. It's your, say it's my job. Just say it's my job. It's my job. And he says, anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety. Here's the word pictures again. Variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, straw. Like, we understand that. That's not what it means, right? You guys know this. These are just word pictures. They're, ju they're just, just like Jesus is a foundation rock, the, the things that we build with to build his, his, his house, because it's not really a building like this, it's a, it's a group of people. These are just a variety of different procedures and processes and ways and ideologies and perspectives and priorities and, and techniques, right? And even some room for theology. I'm not saying that anyone can say there's more than one way to be saved. I'm not saying that creation isn't real. I'm not saying that Jesus isn't deity. These are close-handed issues. But, but, but some people think that, that there's still apostles, prophets, and some people do not. But does that make them a Christian? No matter how they believe? If they, what, what do you got to do to be a Christian? Bow your knee to Christ, right? Would you all agree? So, 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 so there's all kinds of different little quirks to our theology, but he's saying, listen, no matter what it is, no matter how you go about it, there's all kinds of different people doing it all different kinds of ways, and it's okay. Verse 16, don't you realize that all of you, like no matter what you're really believing, it's coming from the Bible. Listen, you could talk to a, to a Baptist and you could talk about a and talk to a Methodist, and you could talk to a Pentecostal, and you could talk and, and, and you say, okay, here's the subject. Die. And brilliant men of God, they will study the scriptures and they will ring it out and they'll do the concordance and the commentaries, and they'll come to three different conclusions. Who's right? And you know what every one of them will say? Well, the Holy Spirit confirmed that I was. They'll all say it. So what is the Holy Spirit now? Three? So what is it now? Six in one, the whole the God, God of the universe. Like, what is that? So, so, so we have to give some space for for what we believe, right? So there's all these different ways that we go about doing it, and it says, "Don't you realize that all of you who are doing it in different ways, with different techniques, and different priorities, and different perspectives, and even some tweaking in our theology, but all of you together, not in separate buildings, all of you together." are the temple of God. Why? Says it. Because the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. That's why. Even, even if your theology is crooked, right? Even if you're wrong about something, even if I'm, you know how many times I've, I've said wrong things up here? Dozens of times, I'm sure. And, and if I knew what they were, I'd, I'd tell you that I regret that. I pray for accuracy every single time I preach. But am I going to say things wrong? Absolutely. Does that mean you don't have to go here? No, he said wrong. Well, you think it's wrong, but maybe I think it's right. Who has greater faith? Want to fight about it? That's kind of stupid, right? What are we supposed to do? Space. Give space, right? It's not right about everything. Space. Look what it says here, too. It's I'm just, just, just the words of God. It's so awesome. Anyone who builds on that foundation may. What is that? Permission. Right? You may do this. Can I do this, Daddy? Yes, you may. Can I go here, Mom? Yes, you may. He says, yeah, you may do this. It may be this way. It may be this. It may be that. He's permi it's permission to use different ways. And if there's pushback against this harmony that God is so desperately, he died for, if there's pushback against this, you're going to get a holy whooping from God. Right? Look what he says. He says, all of you together are God's temple, and the Spirit of God lives in you, but God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. 
Like you're going to be fighting against God if you're trying to impose your way on everybody else and make a bunch of clones in your church. That's not what he's looking for. And if you try to destroy this thing of all of you together, it says God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. All of us, verse 16, all of us together, all of us together. And listen, space, right? But if they're wrong, here we are back in Romans again, right? Same thing. What if they're wrong? What if they're really wrong and I'm really right? And I, and I don't confront them and tell them that they're wrong and we need to do it this way because I'm right. This is where I brought up in this stream and we're right about this. Practice with me. Because on Judgment Day, right, there's the day again. You don't have to take care of this. On Judgment Day, it says that fire, okay, there it is again. Jesus isn't concrete, right? Our works and our process and our way that we do and our style and our preference and taste are not straw and gold and silver, right? And, and, and he's not, I don't, I don't think he's actually going to burn, like with fire that we understand, a philosophy. I don't know even how you burn a philosophy. Now, maybe you can pull it off. He's God. But we're, we're, we're using some word pictures here. And he says, but on judgment day, fire, let's just, let's just call it for what it is. God's going to reveal what kind of work. God, God's going to do that. God, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire, God will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, right, that builder will receive a reward. I don't even know what that, does anyone know what that reward is? I don't know. It's not listed. But will you get one? Do you want one? I want one. I want one. Okay. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. So I don't even know what that means. But I know one thing, you ain't getting no reward. So that's bad. Now, for us to take a firm stance and say, my way is right and your way is wrong. And we're going to do it this way. And this is the way the church is going to be now because this is the way I was brought up. And this is the way it's supposed to be. That's wrong. It says, listen, even if they're wrong, even when I come to judge their work, if they're wrong, that doesn't mean they weren't saved. Look what it says. They're saved, right? But as someone who's just barely making it. But they're saved. So what does that mean? What if that brother or sister is wrong in their practice and a little bit wrong in their theology. They're still your what? Your sister. And what are we supposed to do with other brothers and sisters? Extend an open hand of koinonia, of partnership in the gospel work. We're not supposed to say, you're wrong, you're wrong. No, no, no. That's wrong. On judgment day, he'll take care of all this. So he doesn't need our help. Okay, so um, last but not least, let's go over to, to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, verse, starting in verse 11. I love this. We, we are so, <laughs> we, churches, I love the diversity in this church, but I, it could get better. But churches are, so homogenized. They're so conformed into the image of, not Jesus, of maybe a certain pastor, a certain group, a certain people group, a certain look, a certain way, a certain ethnicity. It's like that in all things in this world. Like the video earlier talks about all these different ways that society divides us, but in the church it's not supposed to be like that. So you see, he says in verse 11, in this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. But just in case you didn't know, back in those days, you were either God's chosen people, you were Jewish, or you were anyone else on the planet. That's Gentile. Kind of sums it up. Like, it doesn't matter what human you are on this globe. Then he gets into more detail. Circumcised or uncircumcised, that's with Jewish or not. Um, barbaric 
uncivilized. Right? I love this. So, 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 we, so we're in the church, right? And, 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 the, and the super conservative guy who's a cessationist who doesn't believe that the, some of the gifts of the Spirit exist now, they're in church. And all of a sudden, the continuationist, the one who believes that the gifts still go until Jesus comes back again, they're expressing their gift over here. And, and we don't want to hang out with one another because we're not, they're not conforming into our image, right? And, and we're like, oh, you know, the Pentecostal people are, are freaking out and they're charismatic and they're freaking out because these people are super conservative and, and you're quenching us and we can't do this. And then over there, they're like, they're all crazy over there. They're just crazy. And this is what happens in the church. Am I lying? Am I lying? Right? So, like, you know what Paul says? How about when this guy walks in your church? Right? How about this guy? How about that? What's in your wallet? Right? How about the, the crazy, the barbarian? How many people are concerned whether the barbarian is going to prophesy in their service? No, he walks in with a bear rug on and a bone through his nose, and you're like, just don't kill me. Right? And Paul's like, it doesn't make any difference if that dude walked into your church. There's no difference. It doesn't matter how, how many scars he has and how many people he's killed. It doesn't matter how they express their, their love and worship of the Lord over here versus these people over here. It doesn't make any difference. What, is, what, is it, what matters? Christ is all that matters. Christ is all that matters. What you think, li get, listen, it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't make any difference if you even think that other person is a Christian. It's not up to you to decide. God sees the heart. You see the outside. You have no idea if their heart has been bent to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And even if that dude walks in, it doesn't make any difference about difference. All that matters is Christ is in all those people. So in this room right now, if you have bent the knee to Jesus Christ, Ephesians 1.13 says that he's given you his Holy Spirit. That means you're a Christian. And if you, if you worship the Lord enthusiastically and, and, and charismatically, then you're a Christian. If you worship the Lord quietly and reserved, you're a Christian. If you bent the knee to Jesus. And that's all that matters. All these other things that separate us out in that world, because the world is hell-bent on destroying. But God is, is, is heaven-bent on uniting and causing harmony to flourish in the church. So he's saying, if, if you have Jesus in you, that's the only similarity that you need. It's the only similarity that counts. The other stuff is nothing. If Christ is all that matters, then what about the other stuff? Anything else. Just tell me. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Is Jesus your Lord? Then you're my brother. Is Jesus your Lord? You're my sister. Is Jesus your Lord? Then you're my sister. Is Jesus your Lord? Then you're my brother. Is Jesus your Lord? You're my sister. Can we go around the room, right? Is Jesus your Lord? Then we're family, right? Are we all the same? Do you all look like me? Do you all act like me? Do you all sing like me? Do you all dance like me? Do you all pray like me? Do you all give like me? Do you all serve like me? Do you all love like me? I don't know. We're all different, but you bent the knee to Jesus, so we're in this together. And we have to welcome all that diversity, not just aiming for it, but welcoming it and going after that as something intentionally. That is our goal. That's what we're going for. That's what we're going for. And so, if Christ is all that matters, how do we deal with this angst that's inside of us that we don't like that person in the way that they do it. Because you have it. And I do too. Look what he says. And it's the word must. There's no wiggle room, right? You bent the knee to Jesus? Okay, then this isn't optional. You must Clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy. What's that mean? Withholding your, 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 your right? They're, they're doing something you think is wrong, and you just want to go after that, right? Tender-hearted mercy. I think they deserve to get blasted by me, but I'm not going to do that. Space. Kindness. I could work on that. Humility, right? Lowering yourself, considering others 
better than yourself, more important than yourself. That's submission, gentleness, patience, right? Patience is important because you're all doing stuff differently. You know, like, Mike, you, you just worship God in a way that I don't think is right. So, so, so what do I got to do? I got to be patient. Because what, listen, because the one who began a good work in you will continue to do so until the day of Christ Jesus. So you're not done. So maybe you're doing something right now that's just not right. Patience is space. An allowance for fault. I love this too. Remember earlier I said, except those who are weaker in faith, like who gets to decide who's weaker? How about this? Allowance for fault. What is that? I don't want to re- rewrite the scriptures, but if I could, I'd put in allowance for perceived fault. Does that make sense? Because, I, because you know, we're supposed to be humbling ourselves before and consider others more important and, and realizing, hey, I might not know everything. Maybe they're right. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But so I'm just going to submit. So, so perceived fault, because maybe you're doing something. I think you're wrong, but maybe, I'm, maybe you're not. Right? Maybe you're not. Maybe I think I know everything, but maybe I don't. Isn't that a great, humble attitude to have as a Christian? Give an allowance for fault, and then this is a tough one. You must forgive anyone, that's all people, who offends you. You know what's amazing about offend? It means that they, it doesn't even mean they did anything wrong. Maybe it's your problem, right? Maybe I did something that was totally fine, but you're so your way that you couldn't take it. So, but we're supposed to, right? We're supposed to forgive. So if I do something that is like, you're just so thin-skinned that you just can't take it at all, so I offended you. But if I did, but, but I don't know if I did anything wrong, but you're supposed to forgive me. And likewise. It doesn't speak of the person who was at fault. It actually speaks of the person who's offended. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And then here's the close of it all. I love how God's word is just so perfectly placed, like all this, Romans, 1 Corinthians, now Colossians, we come to the end of it, and he's like, above all, all that stuff we've talked about, that's all important, but above all that, the most important thing, clothe yourself with love, clothe yourself with love, he says, clothe yourself with love, which its result would be that it would that love would bind us, that means together, bind us all together, and there it is again, in perfect harmony. In perfect harmony, right? What does that look like? How does that happen? How does it happen that if we have love, it will bind us together? Because love is offering an open hand of partnership. Love is opening it is 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 extending an open hand of participation in your ministry together even though that they're different and he would welcome anyone who's a true believer even if they're different than you. The love doesn't ensure conformity into one person's image. It doesn't ensure homogeneity but it ensures harmony. And, and, and we're not alike in any way except this. Jesus is in you. That's it. That's the only thing that matters. We're to be one body called to live in peace. And I can tell you as someone who's been doing this now, like this is my main gig for several years now. Most churches are not living in peace. And often right here at this church that I love, and I love you all, we're not living in peace. Because everyone's posturing and positioning for their way. That's who we are. And that's not what God wants. He wants something to be different. See, that, the vision of the original church planter 2,000 years ago, the one who said, I will build my church, is that he wanted to have a church that would go after the diversity and that all of us together would make it 
more beautiful than it could ever be if everyone was exactly like Carlos, if everyone was exactly like Paula, if everyone was exactly like Sean, if everyone was exactly like me. That's not beautiful, especially me. <laughs> but see, this is the vision that Jesus Christ has for his church. And because that's the vision that Jesus Christ has for his church, that is the reason why that is the vision that I have for this church. Okay? That's it. And, and listen, so I'm just going to tell you right now, for anyone who would posture and, and impose, this is what I just shared with you. This is Jesus Christ's church, and this is who I am, and this is what this church is, and I'm telling you right now, it's never going to change. So if, 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 this is, if you're in agreement with the word of God that this is what the church should be, then you're in the right place. This church is not to be uh, Baptist. It's not to be uh, fundamental Baptist. It's not to be uh, Southern Baptist. It's not to be Anabaptist. It's not to be Presbyterian. It's not to be uh, Episcopalian. It's not to be Anglican. It's not to be charismatic. It's not to be uh, cessationist. It's not to be continuationist. It's not to be reformed. It's not to be Arminian. It's to be a, a God-honoring, Bible-driven church of Jesus Christ. That's what this church is. That's what a real non-denominational church is. It's a church that just says, this is what we want. And so that is reflected in our faith statement here at our church, which is way different than you've ever seen in any church I know. This, this is not a, some long list of, of beliefs that, that because Moses believes in it, then that means you have to believe in it to be a part of this church. That's not the way it is, because that is not the space that God is saying that we're supposed to give one another, right? That does not display humility when I say, I have, uh, we're a non-denominational church, and so as long as you agree with the pastor on these next 47 points, then you're part of the church, okay? That's not the way it works. This is our faith statement. It's on Facebook. It's on our website. The Bible is God's word. You guys all on board with that? Are you on board? Okay. The Bible is God's word. With approximately 7 billion people on the earth, we realize that everybody will not believe, worship, pray, serve, give, and practice their Christianity exactly the same way. Are you on board with that? Yes? Anyone? Half-hearted there. Are you on board? Okay, awesome. We believe that this is okay. That's space. We believe in sharing God's word passionately and completely. Not so that I can coerce you into being who I am. It's so that you can fall in love with Jesus. And then you worship him the way you see fit when you open the book and read it. And who am I to tell you what to do? I'm just an unworthy servant doing my duty. And so are every single person in this room. And so our philosophy is what? Open it. Read it and do it. It, it. There's no caveat. There's no asterisk in there that says, open it, read it, and do it the way Moses says to. It never said that. And we need to stop thinking that. It doesn't say that. It says that God's word is true, and you have the space to worship him the way you see fit. So listen, moving forward from this day on, this is the 9th of February, 2019. Moving on from this day, we are going to be a church that is intentional about harmony. We're not just going to say it's okay for people to be different at the fellowship or at the warehouse or at the father's house or at Emmanuel. Or, or, no, we're going to say we want you here. You're different? Oh, that's awesome. Not like, oh, we're afraid of you because you might try to mess with. No, no, no. We want you here because there's probably a piece of the puzzle we're missing. And that puzzle piece, it might just be you. And so we would extend an open hand of participation to every true believer. Let me just tell you something. When you do that, it's dirty. It's ugly. It's messy. There's pain because people, what you're saying is we are open for you to hurt us. 
But we have to trust that Jesus Christ is building this church, not me, not him, not him, not any of us. He is building his church. And if we do it that way, by opening up an open hand of partnership to all those that are believers, then that allows him to actually build his church, not mine or yours. Okay? Okay, so listen. Come on up, Tom. This is what we want to do. I want to give you an opportunity here. Unashamed, like God's word says that if you're ashamed of me before people, I'll be ashamed of you before my father. You know that, right? So we're supposed to make a public declaration that Jesus Christ is our Lord and we want to do it his way. Do you guys understand this, right? Your, your faith is between you and him, but it's not a private faith. It's to be for the world to see, right? Why would, why would you have a light and put it under a basket? If Jesus Christ lives in you, Right, you want to let the world know about it. Do you agree? Okay, so listen. I'm going to give you an opportunity right now. This is a bold play, but I'm playing it anyway because it's important. And we can't just continue to, to, to beat around the bush or be on the fence on this thing. Okay? God's word is adamant, okay? Adamant about his desire for us to aim for harmony. That means lots of diversity and it's okay and we want that. If you believe that God's word is true, that you heard tonight, and you would commit right now to being part of that kind of church that aims for harmony. And no longer are you trying to, 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 to trap people into your little denominational belief or your little stream or your little way or my philosophy or my practice is right. If you're willing to cast all that stuff away because it doesn't matter, and stand with Jesus Christ, who said, I want us to aim for harmony in the church. I want you to stand now. And if it's not who you are, don't be ashamed. That's okay. We love you anyway, even if it's a no. Awesome. Standing is good. Living it out is a whole different thing. It's going to be ugly. But listen, our church right here, like almost 15 years ago, this is the church that I described to you tonight. This is the church that Jesus asked me to pastor. And, I, and I'm not backing down off of this, ever. And people have come and gone and come and gone because they came in and they, and they were so happy about an open door policy. Oh, non-denominational, awesome. And they came in saying, oh, you accept us all, great. But as quickly as they got here, they realized that they couldn't conform me and this church into their image, and they left. That needs to stop. We need to give each other the space to be who God has made you to be, right? Isn't this okay? It's good, right? He could be dancing up a storm. We'd never know. That's all right. You stick around here long enough, you hear, you worship with Daisy, it ain't going to be that right there. I can tell you that right now. It's going to be a lot more expressive than that. Isn't that okay? Can we just give each other space? Let's just do that. Let's just give each other space. Do you feel like God spoke to you tonight personally? Anybody? Anyone? pray with you, and then unashamedly, I'm, we're going to receive an offering. Listen, tonight, you know, we do an offering every single service on the weekend. It's always like, okay, what? What? Okay, here's the deal. There's a lot of great churches in this world. There's a lot of great churches in town. But this is the church that God has called you to. And the church that Jesus wants, the one that I described to you tonight, I want you to join me. To I want you to fight for that with me. I want you to stand your ground, hold your ground, and, and fight for that because that's the kind of church that Jesus wants. And so I'm unashamedly asking you to invest in that. This church will grow upon the generosity of those that are sitting here now. 
And this message of harmony will go forth more aggressively if we, as God's people, are here right now, fund that thing. 